return to debates as we show you a North Dakota Senate debate between Democratic incumbent Ken Conrad and Republican Ken Clayburgh. And that's the C-SPAN program schedule. Now from Topeka, Kansas, a debate between candidates running for governor. Republican nominee Bill Graves faced Democratic nominee and U.S. House member Jim Slattery. The two are vying to replace Democratic Governor Joan Finney, who's retiring in January. This debate was sponsored by Topeka TV station KTKA and runs about an hour. This is a 49 News special, The 94 Vote, a debate between the candidates for Governor of Kansas. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. This is the fourth and final in our series of debates leading up to the general election. With us this morning, the candidates for governor. On the Republican side, Secretary of State Bill Graves. On the Democratic side, Congressman Jim Slattery. Before the program began, we flipped a coin to see who would give their first, the opening statement first. Mr. Graves won the coin toss. You have two minutes for your opening statement. Uh, Marty, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, and uh, debate the issues and be part of this, uh, this forum. Uh, I have had the, uh, the great pleasure of being the Secretary of State and serving the people of Kansas for the last eight years, and I'm certainly anxious for the opportunity uh, for four more years as Governor of Kansas. Uh, I'm honored to be the Republican nominee, and I look forward to earning uh, the votes of the people of this state over the next two weeks. Uh, as many people know, I grew up in Salina, part of the Graves Truckline family, uh, where I learned uh, at a very early age about taking care of customers, because that's how our family uh, was successful over very many years. And that's the uh, experience that I brought with me when I came to Topeka uh, to serve as Secretary of State uh, in 1986. And I believe that we've had a, an excellent record of not only efficiency in the way we've run our agency, but also uh, an effective level of state service. Uh, I chose as my running mate uh, in this election the Senate Majority Leader Sheila Fromm from Colby, one of the really fine uh, state legislators in Kansas. Uh, Sheila and her husband Ken are wheat and corn growers in the northwest corner of our state. Uh, and I think the combination of, of uh, Sheila and myself uh, as a ticket brings us the kind of uh, background uh, with business and agricultural experience that serves this state well, uh, certainly brings legislative experience together with uh, executive branch experience. And I think, quite frankly, the geographical balance. Uh, Sheila's roots in Colby, my hometown in Salina, now residing in Lenexa. That gives us, I think, a very excellent perspective uh, of the diversity of our state and I hope the ability to deal with some very real questions. Uh, we've talked now for, for over a year about the tough issues facing the future of our state, school finance, crime, uh, health care reform, welfare reform, uh, and I certainly believe that the next governor, as governor, uh, will work very hard to improve the quality of life for Kansans, wrestle with some tough questions, but certainly uh, continue to provide the uh, excellent, effic efficient, and effective service for the people of this state. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Mr. Slatter, your opening <coughs> remarks. Well, Marty, it's great to be here today and have this opportunity also. Let me just say that I am very optimistic about the future of Kansas, but uh, it isn't going to happen by accident. I think it's very important for us to elect a governor who has the experience to pull us all together in an effort to address the urgent problems that await us. And certainly nothing is more urgent than the need for us to make our communities safer. And that's why I have spent a lot of time putting together a crime plan that prompted the Fraternal Order of Police to do something they have never done before, and that is to endorse a candidate for governor. And I appreciate their endorsement. I recognize that we have to deal with our juvenile justice system in this state. We have far too many juveniles that are literally out of control and we don't have the facilities to deal with them. And if we hope to get the crime problem under control over the long term, we have to deal with this juvenile justice system. I've also put forth a welfare reform proposal. It's time to quit talking about welfare reform and it's time to act. I believe we should require welfare recipients in Kansas to sign a contract with the state whereby they would agree to accept any job available in return for assistance or get involved in job training uh, in an effort to become employable in the days ahead. I also think it's important for us to restore some tax fairness in our state. That's why I have called for a 50% cut in car and truck taxes in Kansas. We have the highest car taxes in the country and the oldest automobiles in the country. And it's time that we address that problem, and the proposal that I put forth will enable us to do that over the next few years. I also recognize that the next session of the legislature is going to get us into a very difficult battle on school finance. And I'm committed to putting together a school finance formula that is equitable for all the students in Kansas. 
I hope that you conclude also that I have the preparation based on the fact that I grew up on a farm, I started a business in Topeka, I have lawmaking experience at the federal and state level that I think uniquely prepares me to be the next governor of this state, and I would very much appreciate your support on November the 8th. Thank you very much, Mr. Slattery. All of the issues you mentioned we will get into more in depth in the debate, but let's start with the number one issue of concern to voters in Kansas according to recent polls, and that is crime. The first question, we'll start with you, Mr. Slattery, for your response, you'll have one minute. Uh, outline, if you would please, in that one minute, your crime plan for Kansas. Well, it's difficult to do it in one minute, but let me just say that we have to be committed to getting violent people, regardless of their age, out of our communities and keeping them out of our communities until they're prepared to become safe and productive members of society. I also believe it's very important for us to deal with the juvenile justice system. I think that uh, the juveniles in this state are out of control in many cases, and we don't have the facilities to deal with them. It's time for us to talk, talk uh, about a reform school to deal with some of our juveniles in this state. I've called also for the establishment of a pilot project that I call a drug court, uh, modeled after what they did in Miami, Florida, that I think will help us deal with some of the drug offenders and hopefully try and get them rehabilitated. I think it's very important for us to realize that we have to also be focused on prevention, long-term prevention, which gets you into substance and alcohol abuse treatment, child abuse treatment, and um, these kind of things as a comprehensive effort to deal with the long-term crime problem. Mr. Graves, one minute. Thank you, Marty. Uh, well, clearly we have decided uh, in this state that we're going to see to it that violent offenders are incarcerated, and I certainly think that uh, we need to, to work harder to uh, eliminate uh, uh, a degree of the good time credits that have been uh, applied to violent offenders. They need to serve uh, the terms that they have been sentenced to. I also believe that relative to juvenile offenders, we have to make sure in our uh, regional detention facilities uh, that those juveniles are under the control of the Department of Corrections and are under SRS. These are violent young people who have committed uh, uh, very serious crimes, and I think we should incarcerate them and, and uh, uh, monitor them accordingly, and I believe the Department of Corrections is better suited to doing that. I do believe that uh, an emphasis by the governor on the juvenile crime problem is, is the place we've got to begin because those are the young people growing up uh, to lead a, a lifelong uh, a, a series of crimes uh, and certainly think uh, that we're going to look for alternative sentencing options to try to keep our prison space available for, for those offenders who need it. Mr. Slattery, 30 seconds rebuttal if you'd like. <clears throat> well, I think it's important for us to, to be aware that every day in Kansas, juveniles are being released uh, back onto the street because we don't have the facilities to deal with them and in many instances these juveniles are dangerous and have no business being released and that's why I've suggested that it's very important for us to to make a commitment to developing the kind of resources necessary to deal with some of these young kids before they commit a violent act that necessitates their incarceration so I think it's time for us to debate some kind of a reform school Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Graves. Well, we, we certainly have uh, in the area of, of the uh, incarcerating uh, either, either juveniles or adults, we have a proposal before a legislative committee to add spaces at El Dorado and at Larner. Uh, I'm committed to doing whatever it takes to see to it that space is available. We are, we are uh, rapidly approaching maximum occupancy in our state. Uh, and while that's a, an unfortunate situation to see occur, we have to be committed, the governor has to be committed to making sure that there is available space to incarcerate violent offenders. Mr. Graves, you, you'll get the next question. We're going to stick with the crime issue, specifically the juvenile crime issue. You have both, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you both seem to support the idea of taking it out of SRS hands and creating a separate youth authority. That would probably necessitate creating more maximum security space for the violent juvenile offenders. How do we pay for all this, Mr. Graves? Well, Marty, first of all, let me just say that, that I have supported the transfer of control of the, of the regional juvenile detention facilities to, uh, to corrections from SRS, but, but have not come out in, in full support of a separate uh, juvenile authority. I irrespective of what we do, whether it's adult crime or juvenile crime, we have uh, obviously have to put resources into law enforcement. We have to support our judicial process, uh, as well as the corrections uh, component in this, uh, in this effort. So, uh, 
I believe that within the existing resources of our state, the $7.2 billion, that we can uh, uh, find the money we need at the state level. And you have to understand this is a multidimensional problem with, with some funds and support flowing from the federal government. Uh, much of it falls on the cities and counties uh, and a lot of, 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 of public involvement from the, uh, from the private sector. But I think the state can uh, uh, maintain its uh, commitment to juvenile crime uh, without asking the general public for tax increases. Mr. Schlatter. Well, there are several sources of funding available immediately. First of all, there will be some funds available under the federal crime bill. I've also indicated that I'm absolutely convinced that we can do a much better job of collecting some of the accounts receivable owed the Department of Revenue. Currently, there's about $500,000 in accounts receivable. If we can only collect 10% of that, it will more than pay for anything that I've suggested. So those are two areas that I think we can look at very quickly for additional funds. But I want to really emphasize that when you're releasing juveniles, onto the streets of Kansas every day that are troubled young people who are crying out for some attention in terms of helping them get their lives in order. And if they don't have families at home to support them in any way, uh, we have got to deal with this problem. And the next governor and the next legislature is going to have to step up to this. I've advocated the establishment of some kind of a reform school or something like the Job Corps Center in Manhattan that uh, would be a highly structured environment where we could hopefully provide some basic skills and discipline to some of these young people that just haven't gotten that at home. Mr. Graves, 30 seconds. Well, certainly, Marty, we need to establish uh, brighter lines uh, for young people so that they understand that there will be a punishment that occurs uh, if a crime occurs. And I uh, support the efforts of the Kansas legislature to give us more flexibility in being able to treat uh, juveniles as adults. Uh, certainly believe that we need to continue to make it clear that as those serious crimes are committed by young people, uh, there will be serious consequences because I think at this time uh, uh, many of them have figured out their street smart as to what they can get away with, and we've got to make sure they understand that there's a punishment. Mr. Slattery, 30 seconds. Well, it's clear that a lot of our juveniles have figured out the system and they're gaming the system. Uh, the fact of the matter is today that in Kansas, a lot of juveniles that commit crimes against property oftentimes really don't spend a day perhaps in jail or any kind of a juvenile detention facility. And I think that needs to be corrected so the juveniles, when they violate the law the first time, will be punished the first time so that they don't want to have a second encounter with the law. Let us switch our attention to adult criminals. The Kansas sentencing guidelines that are now in effect have been applauded by some because they are getting violent criminals behind bars for longer periods of time, but are being criticized by others because of the presumptive probation on pr property crimes. We start with you, Mr. Slattery. Do you think the sentencing guidelines currently in place in Kansas are strict enough, or is there tuning, fine-tuning that needs to be done? Well, there is some fine-tuning that needs to be done, and, and uh, particularly the sentencing guidelines assume pr presumptive uh, probation for uh, things like uh, taking indecent liberties with, with children, and also uh, uh, aggravated assault uh, presumes um, uh, probation, and I think those two areas should definitely be changed. And um, I recognize that uh, there have been other problems with the sentencing guidelines, but I think there are some fine-tuning that needs to be made with the sentencing guidelines. Mr. Graves? Well, Marty, certainly uh, our attempt in sentencing guidelines was to, to, to find that balance between those individuals that, that, that need to be incarcerated and set a, a length of time that, uh, that is, it is appropriate for the kind of crime committed. Uh, we have to be very careful. We've got, we've got to make that sort of a grid process work because, one, I think it does establish uh, a clear indication of how much time people will serve for certain crimes. But, two, uh, I think the nonviolent offenders, we do have to look to alternative sentencing, uh, whether it's uh, community corrections or whether it's house arrest or electronic monitoring, whatever we can uh, develop along those lines because uh, with the very limited number of prison spaces we have and with our desire to not uh, break the backs of taxpayers in building additional spaces, uh, we're going to try to make some very fine decisions about uh, who needs to be incarcerated and who we can come up with an alternative uh, uh, sentencing structure for. I certainly support that. I understand there's a con there's, it's controversial, and I think we can adjust sentencing guidelines so they do serve us well. Mr. Slattery, rebuttal? Well, clearly, like I've indicated, the sentencing guidelines do need to be fine-tuned. And let me also say that I think it's very important for us to get nonviolent people back into the community and involved in some kind of community-based corrections whereby they can repay the victims that they have injured and the community that they have injured. It makes no sense to me that we send nonviolent people off to jail and spend twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars a year to incarcerate them and they come back after having lifted weights for a few years just stronger and more streetwise in terms of criminal activity. Thank you. 
Uh, Marty, we have uh, approximately 6,666 available spaces in our county uh, uh, jails and in our state uh, prison facilities. We are rapidly approaching max maximum occupancy, uh, and so we have uh, really two choices, build more spaces or figure out ways to, to weed out some of that population who don't need those precious uh, prison spaces. I think we have to do a little of both. We're probably going to have to expand the El Dorado facility and some at the Larnard facility, but again, we need to modify sentencing guidelines to give us flexibility to not incarcerate violent, uh, some violent offenders. Thank you, and we will continue our debate in just a minute. Thanks for staying with us with this debate this morning. Let us go back to a, let not go back, let's switch from crime to the second major issue according to the voters in Kansas, and that is the economy. Kansas not only has to compete with the other 50 states, 49 states, but it also has to compete with the rest of the countries in the world. Mr. Graves, we start with you. What is your economic plan for Kansas? How would you make our economy stronger? Well, first of all, Marty, we've made some excellent changes already. The change in our corporate farming laws are going to help us in the southwest corner of the state. We made some changes in tax laws relative to the oil and gas industry that are very positive. Uh, so we're, we're on, the right, uh, on the right track, especially uh, in addition with the highway program. I think, uh, one, the governor needs to get the Department of Commerce a little refocused on job creation and true economic development initiatives. We've seen money from the Economic Development Initiatives Fund uh, stripped away and spent on some things that aren't traditional economic development items. And I think, one, we've got to refocus those dollars, uh, job training, retraining, uh, uh, you know, Main Street kinds of programs around this state. Secondly, uh, I think the tax uh, stability in our state is very important. I oppose the sales tax on services. I support the elimination of the sales tax on labor used in construction and the elimination of the sales tax on utilities used in manufacturing. I think that we can send some very strong signals about creating a pro-business environment in our state. Mr. Slattery? Well, I think the tax stability is very important for the future of this state. And as someone who is involved in the real estate industry and got sort of hammered by a lot of the changes in the 1980s, uh, I'm a, a strong believer in tax stability, and uh, I would uh, favor removal of the sales tax on new construction. I oppose sales tax being imposed on professional services in this state. I think we need to do a better job of administering existing property tax laws in this state also. Now, beyond that, we have to recognize that in Kansas today, nearly 60 percent of our employers claim that they struggle to find employees with the skills that they need to fill the jobs that they have. And that's why I'm such a big fan of school-to-work programs. I think it's very important for us to connect better all of our educational institutions with uh, our employers. Now, in addition to that, we have to also be committed to maintaining our highway system in this state and our telecommunication system because th that infrastructure is absolutely essential to our economic future. Mr. Graves, 30 seconds. Well, in addition, Marty, the, the governor certainly needs to be the leading advocate for, uh, for selling our state. We need to be able to reach out and encourage businesses to either expand or those that might be looking to relocate or locate in Kansas uh, uh, to do business. The governor needs to be an active partner uh, with, with business recruitment. But also, I want to go back to the highway program. I certainly believe it's been one of the real key economic factors in our state in the last couple of years. And I do support continuation of this program. And in fact, I'm anxious to sit down and look at the way we can expand highway construction and development uh, into the future years. Mr. Slattery, 30 seconds. One of the things that I think the next governor has to also really work hard at is selling our state nationally and internationally. Uh, promoting trade, finding opportunities for Kansas business because as we sell our products nationally and internationally, we're certainly going to create job opportunities in this state. And uh, I'm committed to doing that. And I think it's just absolutely essential that we have a governor that can really do that. Now, beyond that, I think it's also important for us to recognize the future of Fort Riley and how important it will be for the governor to be doing everything possible to uh, make sure that Fort Riley uh, continues to be the home of the 1st Infantry Division. Okay, thank you. Let us talk about another issue, and you've touched upon it here, that's directly related to the economy, and that is taxes. You mentioned tax stability as well as the property tax reform. Kansas has uh, excessively high property taxes when it comes to automobiles. We start with uh, you, Mr. Slattery. You mentioned your property tax reform plan. Please outline that for us. You have one minute. Well, I have um, recognized that in Kansas today we have some of the highest property taxes in the country. We have some of the oldest trucks and cars in the country. And I've responded to that by proposing that we cut uh, car and truck taxes by 50%. And hopefully we can achieve this over five years. 
I'm absolutely convinced that if we would cut car and vehicle taxes, what we would do is see a sharp increase in the number of sales of new cars and used cars and trucks and the additional sales tax revenue generated by that increased in, increase in sales would be dedicated to local units of government to offset the loss of revenue that would result from the cut in property taxes on cars and trucks. So that's the proposal. It's one that I'm going to put on the, uh, uh, the desk of the legislature as soon as possible in January of 1995. I believe it's fiscally responsible and it's achievable and it's a response to a very urgent problem that we have in Kansas today. Mr. Graves. Well, certainly, Marty, both in terms of real and personal property, the state of Kansas is, is almost finds itself in a, in a non-competitive position. Obviously, in the automobile uh, instance, we are one of the, uh, the worst states in, in the country. Uh, I think, of course, the legislature struggled with a, with a proposal to uh, change the structure for uh, automobile uh, taxes in the last legislative session, and we have to revisit that issue. Uh, I thought there was some potential in the uh, proposal that was submitted which would have changed uh, the level of registration fee for new cars. I don't think there's any dispute uh, that we're going to work very hard to see to it that uh, we do something about automobiles. I also think we need to get the uh, property valuation division straightened out in terms of the way it's treating uh, the, the uh, assessments that are being made against businesses in our state and, and think we ought to look perhaps at some sort of a cap or a, or a dollar amount at which uh, property below that amount is not uh, considered in the uh, assessment of property and businesses. Uh, and clearly our personal, our uh, real property taxes in this state have been a problem uh, relative to school finance and we're going to do our best to hold the line there as well. Mr. Slattery, 30 seconds. Well, the proposal the legislature dealt with last year on uh, automobile and truck taxes would have increased taxes on older vehicles while cutting taxes on newer vehicles, and that approach is not acceptable to me. I think we ought to reduce taxes across the board on vehicles, and that's what my proposal would do. I also recognize that um, we need to clean up the property valuation department's uh, approach to administering existing property tax laws, especially as it affects business because we have businesses that are scrambling around counting uh, uh, paper clips and pins for property tax purposes, and that doesn't make sense to me. Okay, thank you, Mr. Graves. Well, ag again, Marty, I, I think that there has been a consensus reached in our state that, that uh, with being the, the worst in the nation on the level of property tax on vehicles, uh, there's going to be a real spirited debate on how we do something about that, and I think, like many instances in the legislative process, uh, sometimes it takes a year or two years to reach some consensus at the State House on how we're going to about go about doing that. Uh, but as governor, I'm certainly committed to seeing to it that that debate uh, continues and that we do reach some resolution that gives our uh, automobile uh, owners uh, some relief. Okay. Let's continue with uh, an issue of taxes, and you both alluded to this as well. The school finance formula that the legislature wrestled with and wrestled with and finally passed. Your opinion of the current status of the school finance formula in the state and what you would do to change it. Mr. Graves. Marty, I uh, didn't agree uh, uh, early on with the assessment that, that equal funding was going to provide equal education. I think that you have to recognize the diversity of our state and realize that there are many intangibles involved in, in, uh, in education and its quality throughout Kansas. Uh, I think that we have to wait and see what the court does relative to low enrollment waiting, see where they move the bar to. Uh, at that time, we need to sit down with school finance experts, legislative leaders, and try to come up with a, with a new formula, somehow a revised formula that distributes the dollars already in school finance in as fair and equitable manner as we can. Certainly, I believe that the state needs to be a better partner in, in the uh, funding of public education. I think it's, uh, it's an embarrassment that for over three years we've been unable to raise the $3,600 per pupil amount. Uh, and certainly, within the existing resources that we have in this state and the uh, competing priorities that we have, uh, I'm uh, very committed to making sure the $3,600 amount goes up uh, and that we uh, distribute dollars throughout this state for public education. Mr. Slattery, same question. Well, the first thing I think we can do in January is raise the budget per pupil allotment from the state from the $3,600 to uh, at least $3,700. That will cost approximately $54 million, and I'm confident that the uh, state will have the revenues out of existing uh, increases in, in normal growth in state revenues to pay for that. I've also suggested that if there are additional funds available, we should increase the amount of funds that are flowing into the formula to deal with children who are at risk. I think that the state has a responsibility to make sure that low-income children in this state are getting the best educational opportunity available to them. 
I also would like to see us try and enrich the funding for special education. The legislature did a good job of increasing that last year, but I think some additional effort has to be made in that area. I am also committed to making sure that if the low enrollment threshold is lowered, that we not get into a situation where we, where we devastate uh, state aid in the budgets of uh, small school districts in this state. And I think it's very important for us to put together a formula that is equitable for the big districts and the small districts. Mr. Graves? Well, Marty, I, I certainly think that the, uh, the goal of $100 a student is an admirable one, but I, I think it's worth at least a note of caution that uh, $54 million is a substantial piece of whatever new revenue we have flowing into the state. Uh, I think when you look at the commitments we have in, in military pensions and our social service programs, uh, I, I think at least we ought to be cautious, hopefully cautiously optimistic that it can occur. Uh, but again, I'm committed to raising the $3,600, but, uh, but need to see the, the revenue projections and what we've got in other priorities before we can make that substantial a commitment. Mr. Schlatter? Well, I'm confident based on the analysis I've done of state revenues and the increase in state revenue that is occurring as a result of normal growth that we can make a commitment to increase the uh, uh, state aid per pupil by $100. And like I said, that would cost about $54 million, and that is well within our reach this year. And I also have been very cautious about what kind of promises that we make this year, but hopefully we can do the $100. I'm confident that we can, and I'm hopeful that we can also do some additional assistance for children who are at risk and also for special education. Thank you. Mr. Slattery, this first question, sir, this question starts with you first. You were on Capitol Hill during the health care reform debate. It did not make it through Congress this year. If elected governor, what would you do on the state level as far as health care reform for Kansas? Well, one of the problems that uh, the, uh, the Congress faced and the president faced this year in health care was the whole question of employer mandates. And I oppose the provisions in the president's plan dealing with employer mandates. Now, at the state level, I want to see the state move aggressively to uh, complete the health insurance reform. I'd like to make sure we have uh, eliminated the problem of pre-existing condition. We need to make our insurance in Kansas portable. I'd like to see us encourage the establishment of purchasing cooperatives so that small business and individuals can band together to purchase insurance collectively and thereby exercise the same kind of buying power in the marketplace that um, uh, large employers exercise. And I also want to see us expand the role of nurses. I'm convinced that nurses can help us a lot in the delivery of primary and preventive care all over this state. I recognize the need for, for some additional changes in the medical malpractice also area. I've called for uh, an alternative dispute resolution process that will hopefully reduce the cost of, of litigation in these, in these kind of cases. So those are some things that we can do at the state level. Okay, Mr. Gray? Well, Marty, certainly the governor now uh, needs to lead the charge to bring affordable access to health care uh, for all our Kansas citizens. Uh, I certainly think that we need to take a common sense, uh, incremental approach, uh, working to not to destroy a, a system that served many of us well, but also targeted towards those who don't have access to health care. I think in Kansas we have a number of underserved areas where perhaps uh, some sort of small state grants uh, to encourage primary care physicians to serve in rural communities is, is one place we can start. I certainly think continuation of insurance reforms, which we uh, started in the last legislative session, were appropriate. I think at the national level, uh, the whole question of tort reform was somewhat missing in the federal debate, and certainly we need to, at the state level, uh, talk about tort reform and the possibilities for cost containment within our state, uh, and the possibility for medical savings accounts, where you may give uh, low-income Kansans a chance to set aside some money, either for cat catastrophic care or for long-term care. Uh, would be some of the uh, kinds of incremental changes that we could make. Thank you, Mr. Slattery. Rebuttal? Well, my running mate, Carol Sater, and I are also committed to dealing with the problem of workers in Kansas who are making 6 and 7 and $8 an hour who don't have any health insurance at their place of employment. And I don't think very many people really realize that those people making that kind of money are pushed onto welfare to get health care if they get sick or if a member of their family gets sick. And I don't care if we're Republicans, Democrats, or Independents, we need to really be committed to dealing with this problem. It makes no sense for us to push hardworking, low-income Kansans on welfare to get health care, and we need to address that problem. Mr. Gray. Well, it's also, I think, important to mention, Marty, that the state has embarked on a, on a phase-in program where we're going to take uh, the health care services for our Medicaid population and try to competitively bid that out. Uh, to health care providers. And I think that that's an exciting development in the sense that it, it, it hopefully will give us, one, 
a good quality of service for those individuals, but two, that there's a potential for some cost savings because obviously it's, uh, it's the cost factor that, that, that is driving this debate in many instances. Okay, thank you. We will continue our debate with the question about welfare reform and casino gambling when our debate continues. We continue our debate with the candidates for governor, Bill Graves and Jim Slattery. Let's start with you, Mr. Graves. Welfare reform, we've touched upon it. Nothing happened on the national level this time. Uh, what can we do here on the state level to reform the welfare system and save taxpayers money and ensure that the people on welfare will actually have skills and training to get jobs? Well, Marty, the, uh, the legislature in the last session went through a whole series of, of really sweeping reforms in terms of our welfare system in Kansas. We're now faced with the very real challenge of making those reforms work. Uh, and I think it's critical that the governor get actively involved. I think welfare for too many years has been a subject that governors have relied on the secretary of SRS to deal with and not get uh, themselves personally into this, uh, into this situation. And the reason it's so important is because besides education, it's the second largest budget item in the state of Kansas. If we're going to really hold the line on cost but still deliver a quality product, uh, it's going to take the very real effort involvement of the governor. We need to see to it that the initiatives passed are put in place so they can give Kansans a sense of personal responsibility, a chance to develop the self-esteem that, that gives them the courage to go out, seek jobs, entry-level jobs, work their way into a higher paying position, and ultimately offer their welf welfare roles. It's important that we stay committed to that because of the, uh, those people need our support, but it's also important because of the great financial obligation the state has in welfare. Mr. Slattery, same question. Well, the proposal that I've put forth on welfare reform would require those Kansans who are getting assistance to sign an individual responsibility contract with the state. And under this contract, they would agree to accept any job available in the community. They would agree to participate in job training if necessary or substance and alcohol abuse treatment if necessary. And uh, those kind of uh, contracts, I believe, would help restore a sense of personal responsibility and help eliminate what I call the entitlement attitude. And uh, I think they would also help restore a sense of personal dignity for the people involved. Now we all know that to make this work we have to deal with the problem of child care. The, the single parents that have children at home, if we require them to work, which we should, or be involved in job training, we're going to have to deal with the child care problem. The other point that we have to deal with is recognizing that a lot of the people that are on welfare are there to get health care. Fully 25% of the people on welfare are there to get health care. And that's a problem that has to be addressed. Mr. Graves? Well, Marty, just uh, a few of the specifics. We now have a law that requires a parental identification uh, so that we can make sure that uh, uh, fathers are, are uh, we can get child support payments from them. Uh, we've got a pilot program requiring young children to attend school in order for their family to receive state benefits. Uh, we've got a, a proposal that continues benefits into the uh, first uh, minimum wage jobs that people get so they don't have an incentive to give up that job simply to receive benefits. We're cutting off uh, AFDC payments uh, after uh, three children. So we've taken some strong steps in, in welfare reform. Mr. Slattery? The one point that I'd like to make in addition to what I've said is that, that it's important for us to also make sure that we are identifying the fathers of children who go on welfare. And we need to communicate to young men that uh, uh, participate in bringing children into this world that we're going to hold them accountable for supporting their, their children for at least 18 years, wherever they go in this country. And we need to have a coordinated state effort and federal effort to do everything possible and I mean everything, to require fathers to support their children. Gentlemen, this last week the issue of unfunded mandates was brought to the fore. Uh, states complain about the federal government passing legislation, requiring them to do things, and then not providing any of the money to carry that out. On the state level, the cities and counties complain about the same thing, that the state passes laws requiring them to do things but doesn't provide any money to pay for it. As governor, if a bill comes to you that puts new requirements on a city or county or local government, would you veto the bill unless it also provided the money for the city and county to carry out those requirements? And we start with you, Mr. Slattery. The short answer to your question is yes. I believe we have too many federal mandates now and too many state mandates, and oftentimes the state mandates on local units of government 
are more difficult and onerous than the federal mandates. And I, I have uh, sponsored legislation at the federal level to prohibit any further unfunded federal mandates. As governor, I will veto any attempts to impose any additional unfunded state mandates on local units of government. I also think it's important to change some of the existing laws that give rise to the mandates that we're all concerned about. That's why I worked this year to make some changes in the Safe Drinking Water Act and also the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, which is a law that regulates solid waste landfills, for example. So we have to go back to some of these laws that are on the books that have been interpreted by regulators uh, to require certain things that just don't make sense and address the underlying law. I've tried to do that at the federal level and at the state level. We're going to have to do that sort of thing also if we really want to get this mandate problem under control. Mr. Graves? Marty, I think this is a place where the governor can, uh, can make a real difference because clearly uh, uh, unfunded mandates, regulations don't just happen. They're, they're created by people and the governor has to set the tone uh, with the people they appoint to key positions and agencies in this state and in working with the legislature that just says it's unacceptable for unfunded mandates from any level to any level to occur. Uh, the answer is obviously yes. Uh, we're fed up in this country with, with any level of government passing on the burden to some other level. Uh, and I think as governor, I intend to set the tone that one, it's unacceptable within the agencies that I control. Two, working with the legislature, clearly uh, uh, letting them know that I'm not going to sign bills uh, that have unfunded mandates in cities and counties. And if necessary, yes, use of the veto if that's what it takes uh, to, to stop that sort of thing. Mr. Slattery? Uh, I don't know that there's need for any additional rebuttal other than to reemphasize that uh, as governor, I certainly intend to veto any attempt to impose additional unfunded mandates on local units of government. Uh, I am convinced that these mandates just cause property taxes to go up and that's why we have to uh, stop them. Mr. Graves? I, I think uh, as we've traveled the state, Marty, a lot of people are, are looking for the, you know, the common sense approach to government. Let's, uh, let's uh, have government there when we need government. Let's <coughs> make sure that it's not overstepping its boundaries, whether it be the regulatory burden or the mandates. And I think that that's, uh, it's encouraging that that mes message is resonating throughout this state. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Whichever one of you ends up in the governor's office, you are likely to have to, not likely, almost guaranteed to deal with the issue of casino gambling in, in the state of Kansas. We start with you, Mr. Graves, your position on casino gambling, be it on Indian reservations or otherwise, and what you would like to see or not see if you are elected governor. Marty, I, uh, I believe that uh, relative to, to, to uh, Indian gaming that we should let the courts and the, and the federal authorities work that one out and, and certainly I'm, I'm uh, committed to, to dealing with that uh, in good faith uh, as, as the courts so choose and if, they, if that's the, uh, the decision that's made, we'll sit down and negotiate in good faith. Uh, relative to any sort of uh, casino gaming uh, elsewhere in Kansas, I believe the people of this state uh, should have a right uh, to consider that in a constitutional question. I think that the question ought to be uh, somewhat uh, narrowly defined in terms of existing paramutual facilities in this state, uh, but I've always supported allowing people to vote on the constitutional questions, uh, the big questions facing us in Kansas, uh, and, and would work, uh, one, with Native Americans and with, uh, with people in that regard. I, I want to point out, though, that I think we need to be careful to make any great uh, future economic plans based on revenue from gaming because it, it's the kind of thing that uh, it's here one day and can be gone the next, uh, but certainly can support those, uh, those uh, situations. Mr. Slattery? Well, today we find ourselves in a situation where a lot of Kansans uh, go across the border in Kansas City to Missouri and spend their money in the casinos that are now open in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, and that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And uh, for that reason, I think it's important for us to allow the people of Kansas to vote on the question of casino gambling. And I think it should be restricted in such a way as to uh, allow the people to vote on the question of having casinos around existing racetracks, for example. And uh, it seems to me that only makes sense so that we don't have Kansans going across the border to Missouri spending a lot of uh, tax dollars and, and revenue that could be coming to this state uh, in our neighboring state. I also believe that uh, the Indians do have the right to uh, have casinos on their reservations. It is their land. It's their nation. And uh, as governor of this state, I'm prepared to negotiate with them in good faith, consistent with the court's interpretation of existing federal law. Mr. Graves, rebuttal? Well, I'll certainly uh, <coughs> simply reiterate, uh, Marty, that uh, we have uh, our economic development initiative funds, mo most of which are derived from lottery funds, we've used uh, effectively uh, in, in many ways to, for economic initiatives. But I think we have to be very cautious about any future plans that, that uh, rely upon gaming revenues for ongoing sources uh, 
uh, for the state budget. Clearly, there have been some examples in surrounding states where one day uh, uh, paramutual tracks or casinos are going great guns, and the next day things aren't going so well. So uh, I certainly support Native Americans and the, and the vote in the constitutional question. Mr. Slattery, 30 seconds. Well, I want to make it clear also that uh, I want to uh, use all the economic development initiative funds that are generated from lotteries to, uh, to help develop the economy of this state. I don't want to see that money diverted for other purposes. And there are a lot of creative partnerships that I think we can enter into between the public and private sector that will help create good paying uh, high skilled jobs in this state. And that EDIF funds that's generated by the lottery are very important uh, to that purpose and we ought to keep them there. Thank you, gentlemen. I want to stick with this issue for a moment because I, you both mentioned paramutual tracks and perhaps tying casinos into those. The Woodlands near Kansas City has seen significant revenue drop because of the Missouri gambling, the casinos there in Missouri. Would you, be, would you support allowing an Indian-run casino in conjunction with the Woodlands and doing whatever it takes to make that part of a Woodlands casino or perhaps in Wichita either. Is that about the only way you think the Native Americans are going to get a casino in Kansas? We start with you, Mr. Slater. I don't think that's the only way the Native Americans could get a casino in Kansas. Uh, clearly, I think they could get a casino uh, on their reservations or on land adjacent to their reservations. And uh, like I've said, I would negotiate in good faith with them in, in that effort. Uh, I do believe that uh, the Woodlands, for example, in Kansas City has seen a sharp decline in their revenues and, and the business there simply because a lot of their patrons are going across the border into Missouri and spending their, uh, their money there. And that doesn't make sense to me. And that's why I think it is important for us to get on the ballot a measure that will allow casino gambling around the Woodlands, for example, and uh, similar type uh, racetrack facilities in the state. It only makes common sense. Uh, whether you like gambling or not, the fact of the matter is it's occurring in the Kansas City area. And it seems to me we ought to structure this so that we don't have Kansans spending their gambling dollars in Missouri and filling the tax coffers of Missouri. They ought to be filling the tax coffers of Kansas. And that's why I'd like to see us vote on it and resolve the issue. Mr. Graves. Well, well Marty, I think you're really asking whether we support uh, allowing land to be dedicated uh, to Native Americans uh, for that to occur, and, and uh, the answer is, is no, that I don't. I, I believe that, uh, again, that uh, Native Americans should have the right to have, uh, uh, if the courts determine and the federal authorities determine that they're allowed to have uh, gaming on their land uh, that currently uh, held by them, I, I support that wholeheartedly and will negotiate in good faith to see to it that that occurs. Um, but I think that uh, clearly uh, the question of development along the woodlands or the new uh, uh, facility down by Pittsburgh or, or Greyhound Park in Wichita, I think that that ought to be tied back uh, to, a, to a separate constitutional question of, of uh, casino gaming um, and uh, uh, am willing to allow the, the uh, for-profit operations uh, uh, to, uh, to manage those facilities. Mr. Slattery? <clears throat> well, let me just emphasize again that I think it's very important for us to get to a vote of the people the question of casino gambling uh, as it would affect the Woodlands, for example, in Kansas City and other similar type track facilities in this state. It doesn't make any sense to me that Kansans are going across the border into Missouri now to spend their money and fill the tax coffers of Missouri. So let's vote on this question in Kansas. Let's resolve it once and for all and get on down the road. Mr. Graves? Maybe we should get on down the road with the next question. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's do that. Uh, Kansas has found itself in the national spotlight more than once uh, on the issue of abortion. We start with you, Mr. Graves. Your position on the state's current abortion law, would you change it uh, or would, do you think it's fine the way it is? Marty, I, I support the current uh, Kansas law on abortion. Uh, having been involved uh, in the State House now for 14 years, I've watched this issue uh, debated uh, many, many times and uh, watched the, the legislative process that went into crafting the, the current law that we have. And, and obviously there are those who feel uh, uh, it ought to be moved one way or the other, but I think uh, on whole it represents uh, the, the views of a majority of Kansans. Uh, it, it has some restrictions in the law that, uh, that I think are, uh, has restrictions that I believe are appropriate, uh, but I certainly support our, our current Kansas law. Mr. Slattery? Oh, I've indicated that I support our existing Kansas law also on abortion, but I want to go beyond this and deal with some things that will hopefully uh, decrease the need or demand for abortion. And I've advocated that we establish an adoption network, for example, that will enable us to 
connect as best as we possibly can using all of existing telecommunications equipment. Uh, people who want to adopt children, and there are a lot of those people in this state, and, uh, and women who are facing an unwanted pregnancy. And I think we can do a lot to improve that communication process and hopefully thereby uh, decrease the demand for adoption, I mean abortion. Now I've uh, consistently opposed taxpayer funded abortions except to save the life of the mother and in the case of rape and incest. And I will continue that position uh, as governor of this state. Mr. Graves? Well, certainly, Marty, uh, there is a there is an element of tragedy in, in every abortion that, uh, that that occurs, and and as governor, I certainly too am, am would committed to trying to find ways that we can uh, reduce or eliminate the necessity for that taking place. We have uh, an entire social services structure, the economic climate of our state. There are so many factors that that, that play into that. Uh, but as I said at the outset, I, I do support the current Kansas law. Mr. Slattery, 30 seconds. Well, the only thing I would say in rebuttal is that I think that, that abortion is a tragedy, and we need as policymakers and as leaders to, to speak out on this issue and to do everything we can to reduce the demand and the need for abortion. And that gets also into the need for us to make sure that, that uh, we have adequate uh, family planning services available for low-income people especially. So uh, let's do everything we can to reduce the demand for abortion. All right, thank you, gentlemen, and we'll continue with our debate right after this. Thanks for staying with us this morning as we talk to the candidates for governor. Uh, gentlemen, I've got to tell you, I, I feel like it's almost Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. We have sat here this morning, you have both talked about the issues, addressed the issues, and yet when I watch the political ads on TV, I don't see the points on issues. What I see are each of you attacking the other on various different points. Why so much negative advertising and why can't the ads on TV be more like what you've done here this morning outlining the positions? We start with you, Mr. Slattery. Well, I think one of the positions or one of the issues in the campaign is the question is who's financing our campaigns. And the only ad that I have run that could be called negative, I think, is the one dealing with Torchmark. And I feel very strongly that an Alabama insurance company that has really been found to have committed gross corporate fraud uh, and been required to pay a million dollars in punitive damages and then be sued by 410,000 people and that lawsuit was settled for 55 million dollars and this all involved uh, switching Medigap type insurance policies that denied senior citizens oftentimes very very important needed health care treatments like chemotherapy and radiation treatment and, and drug benefits and the only point I've made in that ad is I don't believe that that kind of an insurance company should be pouring tens of thousands of dollars uh, into a gubernatorial election in Kansas. And I feel very strongly that they ought to keep their money in Alabama and not be spending that money, frankly, to uh, mislead voters about my voting record here in Kansas. So uh, I am very concerned about that kind of influence by an Alabama insurance company. Mr. Grace. Well, Marty, uh, uh, obviously one of the dilemmas is, is you're, you're, you're giving us the flexibility of, of minutes plus rebuttals, and that's, uh, it's difficult to do in, in the 30-second in the sound bites. You know, I obviously disagree with the congressman's assessment of, of, uh, of my family's involvement in supporting my campaign. I'm, I'm still perplexed on how uh, a brother-in-law of mine who's an attorney in Palo Alto, California, and his wife, their contributions are somehow linked back to, to, to whatever this is Jim's alleging. I think in corporate America every day, uh, lawsuits are filed, and, and to the extent the settlements are made, they, they ought to be. I don't have any argument with that, but to, to, to say to voters that Bill Graves took money, uh, substantial dollars from Torchmark, is just not true. Um, I have a $400 uh, contribution from that corporation. Uh, the other uh, dollars he's speaking of are, are personal contributions from my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, uh, others a member of my family, and outside directors of that corporation. So I, I think that it's, it, 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 is, it is misleading in the sense that it's not uh, substantial dollars from this uh, corporation. Mr. Slattery? Well, I sharply disagree with that because the fact of the matter is there have been thousands of dollars pouring into this campaign. We don't know how much from this company. And to, to suggest that what they have done is just sort of normal corporate activity is just dead wrong, Bill. I mean, 410,000 people sued this company for doing outrageous things. And another instance involved gross corporate fraud. And that isn't my term. That is right out of the court documents. And I just think that this company uh, and I, I, has no business, and the people that work for them have been obviously hit on to contribute to this campaign. And I'm and I just saying, keep the Alabama money in Alabama. 
I'll give you a couple of extra seconds here, too, Mr. Graves. Go ahead. <laughs> well, of course, the court <clears throat> document you refer to is the plaintiff's brief, which I imagine is not fairly explained. Not, uh, not true. And, and again, uh, you know, the congressman doesn't tell you that two or four years ago in a congressional race, he accepted $1,000 in contributions and waited until a couple of weeks ago to send the money back. Uh, and, and again, this has nothing to do with Alabama. We're running for governor here in Kansas. The only reason it's become an issue is because my father-in-law happens to be the chairman of the board of the corporation. But the substantial dollars are <coughs> personal contributions from my family, uh, people who are supporting me, and it has, it has, no, it has no connection whatsoever. Mr. Graves, I, I'm gonna, we're going to start this question with you. I have a feeling we have a couple of points there that still want to get discussed. Uh, so let me just start uh, with that if you'd like to continue on this question, because I certainly know Mr. Slattery does. If there's anything else you'd like to say on the, on the Torchmark campaign. So this is the question. This is the question. I'll let you continue, or we can, uh, I can throw another one at you, but I guarantee you Mr. Slattery is going <laughs> to raise some other points. Well, uh, let me go back and restate then. Uh, we're talking about, in a spot, uh, the th tens of thousands of dollars. And I mean, I'll ask Jim point blank, what is a, a, an attorney in private practice in Palo Alto, California got to do with this? I have a sister-in-law who works at the Stanford Medical Center. I have a brother-in-law that works for a company, a, a, a life insurance company in Oklahoma City. And his wife, you know, how can you say to people through an ad that the personal dollars they're contributing are somehow tainted through this whole situation? And, and, and you yourself say it's a case that was settled, it's a class action suit, fine, that's the way the corporate system works. Obviously, if there was wrongdoing and the courts determined uh, so forth, uh, there should have been those sorts of damages assessed. They've been. Uh, end of story. It has nothing to do with the governor's race in Kansas. And, in fact, you took money from the same corporation and others that have been sued as well. Okay. Mr. Slattery. <laughs> let, let me respond to this point by point. First of all, I took money from this company before these lawsuits were filed and before they were settled. And I didn't even really know that I had taken these contributions until several weeks ago. And after I learned about what had happened here, I did return the money. But those contributions were accepted before these lawsuits were settled and before uh, I knew what kind of activity this company had been involved in. And I'm just outraged, frankly, that a company like this would be in the business, really, of ripping off senior citizens, and that's what this was about. They were switching contracts that covered chemotherapy, radiation, and unlimited drug benefits because they weren't making money on those contracts. And they switched them to contracts that did not provide those benefits. And a court and a jury concluded in one instance that this was gross corporate fraud. And then there was another case involving not a few thousand, but 410,000 people. And that case was settled for $55 million. Now, this is not normal corporate behavior. It's wrong, and I'm, I'm outraged by it, and I think that uh, that money should stay out of this campaign. Mr. Slatter, Mr. Graves, rebuttal. <coughs> Congressman, tell me what Chris Ritchie in Palo Alto, California, has to do with this. And his wife, Sarah Ritchie, who works at the Stanford Medical Center, and Robert Ritchie from Oklahoma City, and his wife, Lisa. You're talking about personal contributions from my family, and it's, it's unfair. You also failed to mention the contributions you took from Mass Mutual, Prudential, and a number of other insurance companies who have been sued and lost judgments. Are you not outraged at them, and why don't you send that money back? Well, to the Let's best give of you each 30 seconds yeah. for the time. Keep okay. each 30 seconds. Well, to the best of my knowledge, Mass Mutual and some of these other companies have not been found guilty of gross corporate fraud. And th to, to make the connection, the connection is this. A lot of this money was generated uh, by this company. And the people that are contributing uh, to your campaign are people that have benefited from this kind of activity. And that's the thing that I'm very concerned about. And that's why I think there is a connection. And I don't think a company that that kind of a track record should be pouring uh, this kind of money into the gubernatorial campaign in Kansas. That was your 30 seconds. Mr. Graves, if you'd like 30 seconds, I can give it to you, or we can go to one more, to a different question. I think the, 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 the voters deserve better that we go on. Okay. I have time to give you uh, 30 seconds for a question here, and this is uh, going to be a, a bit unusual. With all of the, uh, the negative campaigning, and I understand that you are, are opponents, but there has got to be something when you look at your opponent that you do like about them. <laughs> Mr. Slattery, when you look at Mr. Graves, what's the one thing you do like about it? Well, Bill has worked awful hard this year, and, I, and, and I've never said that I didn't like Bill Graves. He's a nice guy. We have some disagreements on these kind of things that we've just talked about. And, um, you know, so that's what uh, you get involved in in these political campaigns. 
I've known Bill for 20 years, and uh, I think that when this campaign is over, even though we sharply disagree upon th some things, we'll probably still be friends. Mr. Graves, same question to you. Well, I know that, uh, that uh, I, I get in trouble from time to time for, for, for calling uh, Congressman Slattery congressman, and, uh, but I, I think it's uh, legislative experience, and, and I, I chose a, a legislator as my running mate as something I've always had a great deal of, uh, of admiration for. Anybody that, uh, uh, that has a chance to serve in decision-making uh, 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 situations is, is, is uh, you know, I respect Kansas legislators and the members who go to Washington. So uh, uh, we just have a difference of opinion about what the qualities are right now that uh, potentially serve our state well for the next four years. Very quick question again for each of you, 30 seconds. I'm sorry, we don't have time for that. That's, they're screaming in my ear. We thank you for joining us. They're screaming in my ear again. You each have one minute for a closing statement. Mr. Slattery, we start with you. Well, thank you all very much for the opportunity to participate in this forum. And uh, I would very much appreciate your support in the November 8th election. And for the people of Northeast Kansas and Eastern Kansas who have, I have had an opportunity to work for for the last uh, 12 years in the Congress, I thank you for that. And I can assure you of this, if I'm elected your governor, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and do what I've always done, and that is work for the people of Kansas as we address these difficult problems of crime and welfare reform and the need for us to cut our car and truck taxes by 50 percent and uh, to also do everything we can to attract some good paying jobs to this state. So that is my agenda. Those are the things that I'll be working on, and uh, I would very much appreciate your support. Mr. Gray. Well, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for tuning in. Uh, as I said at the outset, I've been uh, honored to be the Secretary of State of Kansas for the last eight years, and certainly I'm honored to be the Republican nominee, and I hope you'll go out on November 8th and support the candidates of your choice. I'm going to work very hard over the next two weeks to try to earn your, uh, your trust and your vote on November the 8th, but more importantly than that, I'm going to work very hard as governor in the next four years uh, for the people of this state. Uh, I have certainly uh, learned my lessons coming up through a, a trucking family in Salina about taking care of our customers. And I think the governor is the number one public servant of our state, and we need to be more actively engaged in seeing to it uh, that we stretch your very precious tax dollars further. We have a $7.2 billion annual budget employing over 43,000 people. And as gover governor, it's going to be my goal to bring a high degree of efficient, efficiency and effectiveness to the operation of state government over the next four years. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us this morning, and I think you did a excellent job outlining the issues for us this morning. We thank you for joining us. Coming up next Sunday, not a debate, but a discussion of the USD 501 bond issue that will be on the November ballot. Hope you'll join Mike Dinas for that. Have the best possible week you can. This debate for Kansas governor between Republican nominee Bill Graves and Democratic nominee and current House member Jim Slattery was sponsored by Topeka television station KTKA. We continue now with our coverage of Campaign 94 as we take you to WSCH-TV in Portland, Maine for our Maine Senate debate. Two current House members are facing each other, Democratic nominee Thomas Andrews and Republican nominee Olympia Snow. They're running for the seat being vacated by retiring Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell. This debate runs about an hour.